director of the Institute for Contemporary Culture here at the Rock. And on behalf of our CEO, Director Janet Carding, it's my pleasure to welcome you all this afternoon to the official opening of our newest exhibition, Jorinda Voigt, Beethoven 1 to 32. This is um, an exciting new project for the ROM. It's our first collaboration with the Illuminati Festival. And uh, something we hope we can repeat again in the future. It's been, it's been a really fun experience. Um, one of those uh, seated in pants types of experiences. But uh, I think you'll agree that everything came together very beautifully and we're extremely proud of this exhibition, which uh, opens today and will run until October 8th. So it's here for the whole summer and will be the ROM's um, entry into the new launch this year. Um, I have a few people I'd like to thank. Um, in particular, uh, from Luminato, uh, Jorn Reisbrot, the, the artistic director, um, Clyde and Robert Vanderberg, who work with us on this project. Um, I'd also like to thank, of course, Yorinda for her, her, her beautiful, beautiful work. You'll be hearing from her in a moment. And um, from Dave, to thank David Nolan, um, gallery in New York, who represents Yorinda and, and was uh, an important partner for us today. So um, without further ado, I'd like to introduce uh, Jorn uh, from Luminato to uh, introduce our special guest, Jorn. Thank you so much, thank you Francisco, and um, really a great thanks to everyone here at the ROM, especially Francisco, Janet Harding, who I had um, sort of one of my Toronto introductory lunches with um, at this breakfast place across the street, which apparently is very famous. Actually, no, it was breakfast at nine o'clock, and, um, and I sort of came, you know, with this exhibition to her and said, you know, we should really do this, and I mean, you know, usually museums plan three, four years in advance and, um, and you know, she sent me an email a week later and said, you know, we have a space and you can even have it for three months. So I'm really excited that this is not only something that's going to be seen for 10 days, but that actually extends uh, into a much longer time period. And um, you'll see on the drawings that um, the last four actually carried as the um, uh, city of creation Toronto in it. So uh, it's you in this first drawing cycle that is uh, done in Berlin and in Toronto. Um, the reason for that was, at the, you know, in the beginning a little bit distressing because we didn't really think we might end up here tonight with all 32 Beethoven sonatas on the wall, but now I think everyone is very proud and actually, probably as our gallerist David Nolan actually said to us um, yesterday or the day before that this is really sort of um, her, her second really big major, major uh, work. Rinda is um, a young German artist. She's just won numerous prizes. She's represented by eight galleries and has like one show after the other. Um, I've worked with her before in the past and I've always sort of asked myself, how do you translate sort of one medium into another medium, and especially with music? I don't know, I, I, I grew up in Germany and we had a compulsory music um, lessons in school until grade 12, I think, which is an amazing thing. But the art in those music classrooms was always so terrible. You know, it was always sort of these colorful drawings and then little, you know, clefts on it and, you know, sort of done in an artistic way. And, um, and because music doesn't, music doesn't occupy space, it occupies time only, and the arts obviously do. So how do you translate something from one medium into the other uh, without illustrating it is, is something that I always found very challenging. And I think uh, Yorinda's going to talk maybe a little bit about um, the way she approached the work, but um, I really have to say that I think she really captured that essence. And uh, this exhibition is really part of a larger, um, gem-like project to me um, that actually is going on right now also at Colonel Hall. Stuart Goodyear is playing all 32 Beethoven sonatas in one day. And when I arrived, that project had already been scheduled and I thought, this is really sort of like a performance piece, like a long duration performance piece. You know, I mean, that man must be getting tired and, and, and you know, lose his concentration, but he actually he doesn't. I was there for the first part and it was simply beautiful, but I thought, you know, the Beethoven sonatas were written um, over 200 years ago, and they're really Beethoven's most personal work. They're almost like his, his, his diary. 
and they were very radical at the time. And Beethoven was not necessarily, they weren't necessarily received uh, so favorably as they are today. And I think in the 200 year history of them being performed and, you know, Billy Joel taking a melody and turning it into a pop song, they've maybe been sort of soft washed a little bit. Um, and um, I thought, you know, what could we do in order to also emphasize this Herculean task that Stuart is doing? And what could we do to maybe return a little bit to the radicality of uh, Beethoven's music? And I thought, you know, why don't we put a visual artist on stage with him and create a, and, and, and have her create a performance art piece that is going on at the same time. So you have sort of this um, other artist that is doing something in response to the Beethoven sonatas. And I also very often feel that what you hear and what you see, sorry, can actually make you hear better. So her performance sort of functions as an ear opener um, to, to his music playing. And I have to say that it really seems to be working quite well and is quite captivating. And then sort of a little, the, 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 the fourth dimension that we are sort of um, um, unfolding this Beethoven exploration is a talk by Antonio Damasio, who's uh, here with us tonight. He's one of the leading neuroscientists in the world. And he's going to talk um, before the last concert tonight um, about um, the relationship between music and the brain. So. I like to sort of try to look at, you know, a certain phenomenon from different kind of sides and bring artists that maybe haven't collaborated before in, in, in touch with each other. Um, one thank you sort of at the end of um, my speeches to the, the German consulate who's been um, um, supporting the, the reception today and, uh, and especially to Sabine Spavasa, or I should say Sabine Spavasa, of course, in good uh, German. And, uh, and now, I would like to ask Yorinda to come up and um, say a few words. Yorinda. Thank you for coming. Um, if you like to, we could uh, I could give you a short introduction and the concept of my work, maybe also in front of one piece. Yeah? Okay. Is this portable? Oh, yes. When uh, Jörn asked me to do a work directly on Beethoven, it was a big challenge for me. And after testing a lot what is possible for me as a visual artist with this kind of music, I decided to focus on the um, emotional text which Beethoven wrote into his scores. And that um, actually I extracted from each single um, part of these of his notations from each bar the Italian or mainly the Italian written um, notes or dynamics and intonation uh, notations and transferred and um, translated them into English to um, have a have, have them in a more normal language or not a, like the secret musician language. <laughs> because what I extracted from the partitures of Beethoven is actually the emotion and the attitude, how to play or how to feel during playing this music. And it's highly interesting uh, what he wrote in his partitures concerning emotion because it's the most widest uh, range or but you could, could imagine how, what kind of emotional attitude you can have. So if you follow me, I show you how I wrote it. Of Beethoven bar by bar. 
it can be it's written in English, and it's like the, the emotional part or the altering emotions, what you maybe know from yourself, what you have doing one day, for example, it, your emotion is slightly changing all the time, and it's each day it's different. And um, I see these kind of passes in Beethoven's music, um, like something like that, or con uh, concerning a day, or also concerning a situation, or um, but it's like an individual part of emotional changes. And what I did, I listened to the music, and then I always, the first thing I did on one paper was um, drawing the very first line, which I later on then write all these um, intonation and dynamics, bar by bar. And I always try to, um, also when I listen to the, this, this certain part of the sonata, to draw it in a way which is, um, captures some characteristics of this um, actual part. And then I do it also for the second part of the sonata. And then I need, a, of course, for a concept like this, I need a certain space where this is happening. And I decided to um, build it out of um, two internal centers and four external centers. And the internal centers are something like the you know, compass. They are here and here. And the external centers are in the corners. They are something like anything that's outside, which is also giving orientation. Um, could be social or geographical or ideological or whatever. And between the two internal centers, it's, there's a line which connects both of them, and from each um, emotional quote, is one line going to this um, line between the internal centers. So it's where it's here named and um, what kind of emotion it is, doing the way to this axis, it's using a kind of its term and it's getting extracted. Um, it's like the extract of all emotions at once in this line. And you have to see the whole thing as a more philosophical mind map, or mind model, I, I would say. This axis I write, um, I, I'd say it's under rotation, so it's like a vortex. It says direction of rotation and then one rotation per day, and then two rotations per day. And also these, the starting points of the emotional passes and ending points are shown to one of the external centers. And the second part is that I extracted from all written changes in the part in the score. I, I write them under each other and if you read it in a musical way, it's also something creating like a very, for each sonata, individual meta in a way. So, this is very much about what kind of e emotion is um, transported in these Beethoven uh, sonatas, and it's actually very interesting to take Beethoven's music and not my emotional changes per day, because they're already traveled, it's, they made this time travel from since they are written to now. And, um, and also, I never knew how it will look in the end, and it uh, was all, always for me, again, 32 times, a very big surprise. <laughs> okay, if you have any further questions, I'm here. Can you can you explain um, how it gets darker and lighter? Does that translate with the emotions as well? Your bunches of lines make it darker. Is that a stronger emotion? Or? I I'm not familiar with that piece, so I don't know what, what really translating into emotions. No, the work is not an interpretation of the music of Beethoven. It's a 
it's an extraction of the emotional um, part by the two. And what if this is getting darker or less dark, it's just a question of density of lines. I play that music, but I look at the carpet that I'm wearing and match it to something on that on you, your art. You, you know, always repeat it, but it's not. I mean, you can do that. I think where it gets denser, also, Beethoven's scores within the the the, the 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 changes, the dynamic changes, are just happening faster. Oh. So that's what sort of also compresses. It, that's what compresses the changes of the, the emotions, and that's why also the lines might get closer together. But it's not, as Irina says, it's not interpreting it, it's, it's translating it into a different uh, language. Yes, and um, how a line is, uh, is done, it's actually done with So it's actually, if you take this series in your imagination, it already looks different when you put it here, it already looks different over there. Oh, so it's easy to describe the work as your interpretation in terms of emotion. I am seeing this because it is your interpretation. You interpret the emotion and feeling as you go in the top of each side, and it could be different from one day to the other. Right? Anything uses a ruler or any other sort of, you know. Yeah, it's basically just the connection between the the, the, the interior centers and and the exterior centers here that have these circles that use any mechanical help. Everything else is drawn by hand. So I mean, apart from what, what I find so amazing about Rina's work is that she has this she has this incredible 
approach to her work, but also she she's really an incredible craftsman. Um, and you know, I mean, the, the, I think any one of us who would even I mean, when I try to draw a straight line, it's never going to be straight. Or even if I want to draw a beautiful curved line. So, so the craftsmanship really in her work, I, I find quite stunning and, and, and very unusual. Any other questions? Yeah. Oh. Um, maybe two questions. Um, they are very, very different. So the differences in look very, very different in the beautiful. Um, I wonder if you um, associate um, a, a overall characteristic with each work, and do you hear them in your head when you look at them? Yeah, um, to translate this uh, different characteristic of each one yeah. into something proportional in a work like that, for me it's very important. It's very concrete to uh, questions which um, I have to solve. And for example, one is, is this line one line, is it two lines, is it there, there, there? Um, and each decision in these things changed completely the character of it. Also the, how, how it is in proportion. And all these proportions which take place, like, of this to this, or this both to this, and also the angles, um, they already um, cause um, a certain kind of characteristic. And that's just my very basic um, decisions I have to make to express what I think is characteristic for this um, single little one. You can hear it in your hand when you look at this and you know which one that is? Uh, not the complete one at yeah. once, but, the, the, but parts of it. Yeah. Yeah. Different musicians interpret each of these differently and sometimes they sound very different. When you did these, were you influenced uh, to different interpretation for each pieces. You mean, you mean from um, you mean from musicians? Mm -hmm. um, and this one I, I actually I listen only from to the recording from the little kids. So I didn't Compared to other translations, uh, interpretations. It was a spontaneous reaction to that. Yeah. Yes. William Kempf is a German pianist who sort of regarded as one of the uh, masters of, of Beethoven and his uh, recording of the Beethoven Sonatas. He's one of the pinnacles that every pianist has to be um, buried by, I guess. More questions? Oh. Uh, how long did it take you to extract one side? Yeah. Um, it's very hard to answer this because before you can do one, you have to develop a concept. And I started doing this when the, the very first thought which I spent it on this work was in November last year. And it, and it took me then also to realize it until the day before yesterday. <laughs> See why I was nervous? <laughs> um, these are beautiful works and you must be a musician or have music in your background, I'm assuming. But I, I was going to ask you, in this work, there's both a very analytical, detailed analysis because you go measure bar by bar by bar, and at the same time you have a very emotional response to the music. How did this uh, completing this work change how you now listen again when you hear the sonatas both from the structure of music and, and the emotional response you get from listening to the music? Of course my, my emotional response is different from the music. At the moment if I listen to this music it's very much focused on what I did. So it's, it's much stronger to have this kind of impression. But, but also these questions listening to it, it's very um, 
still very intense connected to this research of what kind of emotion is this Beethoven is expressing there. And it's very intense what he wrote, his music, concerning what can happen to you and, how, and then also to set up a composition which expresses this again. It's a very extreme thing. And, um, this aspect is of course very dominant at the moment for me. When I listen to it. That was it? Oh. Um, how did you create, like how did you start to finish, did you start with the line and then draw towards it? Or did the line just come from the drawing? Like you, everything sort of centered on one line, it, it all sort of focuses towards that line. So did you start with the line or did you, did it end up there? I did end up there. Well, that was a lively group. I'm glad that she inspired so many questions. Well, thank you so much, everyone, um, for being here and, 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 and look around some more. Um, all 32 Beethoven's analysis is a long piece of music and do come back and tell your friends about it. It's going to be up and I think that's actually very nice too. It's going to be up until October 8th and it will sort of be also the first little Kiss of Nominato to uh, Mais Blanche, first little project that we're actually doing sort of together. Thank you so much.